Chapter 2 The queen was dying, and everyone knew it. But as usual, nothing had changed. Anne Greenlaw sat on the rock in the western border of Emberfall. She stared at her hometown, where revelry filled the streets. Everywhere she looked, people danced and sang merrily to the reels played by the musicians stationed at every corner. Colorful silk banners zigzagged from the rooftop to rooftop. Even here, at the farthest edge of town, she could smell the freshly baked cream puffs that the village bakery made only for special occasions. Special? Anne thought. It's not right. This was something Anne thought often, but only, but she only ever thought it. Saying that or anything like it would prompt her father to repeat the same thing he always said. The queen wants her people to be happy, he would say, and then he'd playfully trace a star on her cheek, connecting her freckles with his finger. That was all anyone said when Aeon questioned the joy that filled the land. That's what every monarch has wanted for a thousand years. It would be disrespectful not to honor their wishes. And although Anne had told this, was told this any time someone died, or poor weather ended a picnic, or she had any reason to be possibly sad, she had a hard time believing that anyone, queen or not, would want people to be happy that she was dying. Three days earlier, when she'd first heard the queen's illness, Anne had gone to bed. She pretended to have the flu, but really she was sick with grief. The queen had always been good. She didn't deserve to die. And then there was Princess Janiah, only a month older than Anne. What would it be like to rule the monarchy at this age? How must the princess have been feeling? But Anne kept these questions to herself. She had no choice. The monarchy had always been a rich and thriving land, and its people a happy and peaceful populace. She learned long ago not to express melancholy or even discuss it. To admit to anyone that she was sad about the queen would mean admitting the very worst thing about herself the thing she never wanted anyone to know, that deep, deep down, in ways she couldn't understand, Anne was broken. She wanted to be happy all the time like everyone else. She wanted to give, it, give in to bliss and rest in the knowledge that their monarch kept them all safe and prosperous. But, what Anne could, but while Anne could fool everyone else into thinking she was just like them, she would never be able to fool herself. So all day long, as Emberfell prepared to celebrate Tower Rise, Anne had played her part. She'd thrown herself into the merriment, she danced joyously, she laughed as her neighbor friends wove her long blonde hair into a braid that circled her head. She appeared for all to see, thoroughly and unquestionably happy. Until at last, as the sun started to set and the excitement in Emberfell hit a fever pitch, she seized her chance and quietly slipped away. She took the western path to the one place where she felt whole and well and normal. With her back to the town, Anne took a deep breath and stared into the maw of the dread willow carse. In all other directions, the edges of the village gently faded into the picturesque landscape beyond. Brown earth gave way to green grass and thick trees. The change was so gentle it was hard to tell where Emberfall ended and the world beyond began. But along the west side, which butted up against the black marsh, there was no mistaking where the village stopped. A pronounced dark line marked Emberfall's border, border, as if the ground had been scorched by an invisible wall of flame. From an early age, all in Emberfell were advised to stay away from the karst. The warning was scarcely needed. One look into the unforgiving blackness and unwary travelers scurrying. Most in Emberfall saw the karst as a blight to be endured. Anne saw it as something else, a remedy. Clutching a long, unlit candle in her sweaty hand, she inched forward. Her toes just grazed the black border. A tingly mix of excitement and fear buzzed through her. The terrifying thrill of standing at the edge of a cliff, the dizziness, dizzy, dizziness of climbing the tallest hill, and the pain of a deep wound that felt like it could never be healed all rustled inside her. In eagerness, Anne also felt eager. Everything, the hair on the back of her neck, 
the knot in the pit of her stomach begged her not to move forward. The cars had this effect on anyone who passed by, but Anne wasn't like anyone else. She alone could ignore that feeling. She lit the candle and walked cautiously onto the black ground beyond. One, two, three. She counted the steps in her head like always. The earth and dreadwell of cars was was the earth and dreadwill of cars gave slightly. The moist soil rushed in to meet her feet and crept up the edges of her boots. She trod softly, fearing her steps would convince, convince the mire to swallow her whole. Thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. With each step, a weight pulled on Anne's shoulders, like the heavy wool that the people of Emberfall wrapped around the dead. Something slick and thorny took purchase at her chest. That sadness she felt over the queen consumed her, drowning out Emberfall's raucous celebration in the distance. Twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three. Anne paused as something slithered at her ankle, a tangle of mire bramble, the carnivorous vines known for pulling anything that moved down into the carse's muck, froze near her heels. She pressed her tongue against the back of her teeth impatiently, when she refused to move, the vine slid off in search of other prey. Aeon continued. Twenty-four, twenty-five, twenty-six. The farthest she'd ever gone before was thirty-two steps. But today she needed to go farther. She needed to. Today is the day, she promised herself, as she had so many times before. Today I learned what really happened to Mother. A hint of something ranks, like spoiled milk maybe, hung in the air. Dreadwillow trees lined the path, their branches with teardrop shapes leaves with teardrop shaped leaves drooping under the burden of festering black moss. They brushed Anne's shoulders as she passed beneath. Each touch sapped of her hope and convinced her she'd never leave. What a chance it was to shrug off the burden of joy. At home, she had all the food she could ever want, comforts that would be lavish and shameful were they not afforded to everyone in the land. Every monarch had seen to it that the people wanted for nothing and suffered no indignities. Yet it was here, giving in to her worry and sorrow, where Anne felt less broken. No one would understand her sadness. She could not understand their glee. Anne stopped in, at a hook-shaped rock that poked up out of the ground, in all her previous visits to the car, she'd never gone farther than this. She'd never been able to. Here at this spot, she was filled with alarm and exhaustion. Just a few more steps, she coaxed herself. But her legs failed to obey. Resigned, Anne closed her eyes and listened. After several moments of silence, she heard it. There were no words, just a light tune that trilled from somewhere in the darkest depths of the cars a sad, haunting waltz. It was almost like singing, but it couldn't be. No one lived here. A trick of the wind in the trees, she'd always told herself. Anne let her head roll back and her arms hang limply at her sides. When she heard that song, she felt as if she'd been turned into a stream. She wanted just to stand there and pour herself into the song. It's salt the melodic river. They would fill each other. A vicious mist rose off the dark-watered bog on either side of her path. The giddy giddiness Anne felt at being able to express her sadness vanished, replaced swiftly by terror. This always happened. The longer she stayed inside the cars, the, the sorrow turned to fear. The comfort she found in the strange music failed her. Now the music sounded shrill and discordant. She turned and hurried back out of the swamp. As she stepped across the border onto the path outside Emberfall, Anne's misery melted away. Her mind cleared. As always, the haunting dirge vanished. A pang hiccuped inside her, and she felt as if something very, very valuable had been ripped from her head, or her heart. She took three deep breaths. Each inhalation brought her calm. Each in exhalation took away a little more terror. In moments, she was back to being who she believed she was, a slightly broken girl. A chorus of bells rang out. Anne shot a glance at Emberfall. Almost immediately, the dancing and merriment stopped as the whole town scrambled about. 
It was later than she thought, wiping away any tell-tale tears, and want wended her way through the town and headed for the village's east side. Outside the mayor's house, she tapped the base of the tall glass statue of Queen Sula that washed over Emberfall with arms extended, welcoming all. Everyone who passed the statue touched the base for luck and made a wish. Anne always wished not to be caught going into the cars. Turning onto the street where she lived, Anne could just make out the outline of her father. He was leaning on his crutch in front of their house at the end of the lane. Anne's father hobbled forward, holding a small tin lantern. The fire within cast shadows like cobwebs across his jovial face. As he reached out to hug his daughter, he nearly fell. Anne chided him gently. You should be sitting. Her father pointed up and down the street. All the town's family stood outside their homes, holding lanterns. If I sit, I can't hold it high enough for our new queen to see, and we don't want that, do we? Anne kissed her father's hand. No one, she often thought, loved the monarchy more than her father. He would do anything to please his queen. The cry of a horn echoed down the streets of Emberfall. It's time, father said. Anne bent over and picked up a cue of a blue glass at her father's feet. For days he had collected scraps of broken glass. He made the cube using tree sap to bind the pieces together and shield the sharp edges. When the horn sounded again, Anne slid the cube over the lantern. Father lifted it high over his head. Everyone in Emberfelt placed similar domes of blue glass over their lights. The village immediately got darker. A cheer rang out from the crowd. Anne turned her gaze southwest. Nine towers had become a distant silhouette, and the queen and the princess were no doubt at the very top of Lith Tower. Anne stared into that lantern. While everyone else's light shone a solid blue, her father's cube twinkled with dozens of azures and sapphires and cobalts, and more blues than she could count. It didn't burn the brightest, but it was certainly the most beautiful. So, father asked, do you think Princess Janiah will be happy? Anne wondered, as she often did, if her father ever suspected. Could he squint at her even now in the dim light and see not his daughter, but an ungrateful girl with imperfect joy? She believed that if he could, she might go to Dreadwell Cars and never return. The shame would be that terrible. Anne smiled, because she knew she was supposed to and she squeezed her, squeezed her father's hand. Aren't we all? That's the end of chapter two.